Well, welcome to uh, this exponential series. We're in the middle of looking at what it looks like when we take people alongside of us. And today we're going to uh, look at Paul and Barnabas specifically. Uh, some of you are still familiar with the name Saul. We're going to get to see that transition happen on this sermon today. So hopefully from here on out, all we're going to refer to is Paul. However, that's going to get confusing because I'm going to refer to Pastor Paul today too. So I'll do my best to keep you in line so that you know that Pastor Paul and the Apostle Paul are not the same person, okay? <laughs> As wonderful as they are, they are not the same. You know, 20 years ago, something kind of unique happened in my journey. Um, 20 years ago, there was a snowstorm in Sutherland, one of those years that we had snow on the ground. And we've had some here and there, but it wasn't quite like that year. And uh, we were new to town, new to family church, actually, 20 years ago. And I can remember it was kind of a fun night. I'd been teaching, and, and there were some kids playing in the street. And I thought, well, they may not know who I am, but I'm sure they would love to be thrown uh, thrown at with some snowballs. So my wife and I went out and began to have a battle in the streets. And uh, the thing that's funny about that to me is our neighbors were gone and we used their snow instead <laughs> because it was so pretty we don't want to mess up our yard. But we began this great snowball fight and then the parents came out and joined in and uh, we ended the night having hot chocolate together. And that happened to be Paul and Jan and the girls, Paul and Jan Glazner and the girls. And that began a little journey in, uh, in my life where uh, Paul and I started spending time together. And uh, he began to uh, share time with me. And we began to fish together. That was a thing uh, that I still enjoy much, uh, very much, but it was quite a passion. And so I invited him to go fishing. And, and through that journey, I'll kind of tell you more of that story, but the fact is he began to ask some interesting questions. And uh, we're going to look at our story today uh, with back to the book of Acts. One of the things that you're going to see here is, uh, first of all, where are we in the timeline? It's important to know that right here we see, back here is the time that Saul, in 35 AD, when he was confronted by Jesus. He was a Jewish leader, confronted by Jesus, and had to make a change. He had to decide, who will he follow? There's this leadership as as Jesus' presence compelled him. So he began a journey here where he was blinded and then came to faith in Jesus. And now we're down the road a bit. So we're actually about 11 years later in 46 AD. He's been uh, discipled by Barnabas. So we're going to start our story here in Antioch. So we'll do a little fly-in. Check this out. As we look at the globe, we've got Africa coming in. You're going to see Jerusalem here, right? This is the island of Cyprus. We're going to zoom in to the town of Antioch. So here we are, we start our story today here in Antioch. One of the things about Antioch, um, you may not know it, but it is considered to be the cradle of Christianity or where the term actually a Christian started here. So the persecution broke out, many left and fled, and many arrived here in Antioch and other areas. And in this group was a church. In this church, we're told in the book of Acts in chapter 1, there was five people together at this time. And so a couple important notes. We have Barnabas, of course, known as the son of encouragement, a cool name, right? We have Simeon, and scholars likely believe he's the guy that helped carry the cross for Jesus. He reached that point where he needed assistance. So Simeon pretty well uh, had a pretty face-to-face interaction with Jesus and was compelled by that. We have Lucius, one of the first evangelists after the the separation happened and they fleed from Jerusalem. He was also considered one of the first founders of the church in Antioch. Uh, Also, we have Menean, and Menean has an interesting history because he was a longtime friend of Herod. We talked about Herod last week, and Herod did not want Jesus to be on the scene. He sent out, uh, well, his, his lineage. He was the guy that wanted to have, uh, you know, the babies killed and stuff so that this Messiah couldn't come. But this lineage comes through Herod. Menean had a connection to that. So I think you could say that he had a very different view, perhaps, of uh, who Jesus was to be here today, part of the church. And then we have, of course, Saul, also known as Paul today. And Saul, interesting, you know, think about first king of Israel. That's a powerful name, Saul. And we're going to be known more from Paul, uh, which means small or humble. In fact, oftentimes, you know, when you read scripture, you hear Paul say, of the sinners, I'm the worst. And I think that uh, name speaks quite a bit of a guy who perhaps was on his way to be almost kingly and now begins to serve and uh, gives his life for his service. So we're taking a look at that. And here's what we we pick up in uh, verse 2. 
It says that while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So we see this uh, story begins in Antioch and a journey begins. And you can kind of follow here on the map as they go through. They're going to head to this island of Cyprus and then continue on in that journey. But what I find interesting, too, is as they begin the journey, why do they go here? Well, the first place they go to is called Salamis. So I'm thinking, well, there's good meats there. So they're going to go to Salamis as their direction. But I think actually what we find out is that Cyprus is where uh, Barnabas grew up in that area. So where will we go? How about where we know? Let's start there. Let's go see some people. Perhaps we'll get into the synagogue there and begin to preach to the Jews. Uh, so they begin a journey. And when they're uh, on their way, they pick up John Mark here, which we'll hear about. Uh, it's important that you'll hear him as John, sometimes as Mark, but they pick up a friend, and they preach in Salamis, and then they head to Paphos. And when they get there, something uh, important happens. There's a guy named Sergius Paulus. Uh, they refer to him as the proconsul, or the governor of this, this region. Uh, and he wants to hear about God from Barnabas and Paul. So he's calling them, come, come talk to me and come share. Uh, but one of the things that happens is there's another guy in town called Elmaeus. And Elmaeus is a Jewish sorcerer, and he's opposed to the teachings of Jesus, and he is distracting and wants to pull them away. In fact, it says here, um, but Elmaeus the sorcerer, for that is his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the pro proconsul from the faith. So he's definitely a problem. And we see something happen here, though, is that because this guy wants to hear, we don't see Paul or Saul or Barnabas or any of them backing off. In fact, we see the name change happens. Then Saul, who was called Paul, officially today, we will not refer to him as Saul. There's a change. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elmaeus and said, You're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. So he confronts him. But before we move on to the story, something important happens here. I don't know if you caught it. See, I would expect it to say, Then Barnabas. You see, because in the journey, I don't know if you noticed the list at the beginning. Barnabas was at the top and Saul was at the bottom. In fact, as you read through Scripture, it's constantly Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul. Paul, all of a sudden, emerges. Something new happens, and the Holy Spirit begins to work through Paul, and he looks at him. And the interesting thing about this, I think, is that uh, when he looks at him, the Holy Spirit gives him a unique ability here, and God, through Paul, blinds Elmaeus. He blinds him. Now, I kind of find that interesting because if you remember, Paul was blinded by Jesus. But see, his turning was a result of that. He was blinded, but received sight and believed in that process. Or he believed and received sight, one of the two. But we don't see that necessarily with Elmaeus, the sorcerer. We don't really know, we can't find out what really happened to him. But he's blinded. And, and so I kind of look at that and I think for a moment about in my own life, Paul, God uses pod, Paul in an amazing way to blind somebody. How many times perhaps as you've tried to witness or share your faith with people, have you thought, if only they would see things the way I did? If only Paul perhaps, if he were blind, maybe he would see. Don't know if that's how he did that. But how many times have you said, you know, if, if maybe my friend just heard this song, because I remember that was really powerful for me. Or maybe if they only heard, if the pastor would say it just this way, I remember a time when that was so powerful for me, instead of realizing it was the Holy Spirit who's at work and the Holy Spirit who opens the eyes. It's not a formula or a thing that happens. It's a call of God and an impact from God. But we see uh, this picture here is kind of cool. If you take a look, um, you can see the blinding here. This is Elmaeus. There's the proconsul up here. He's hanging out, and, and Paul, they got a little halo. But this picture is pretty famous. This moment has been recorded in many different ways of this time when all of a sudden a change happened. The second thing that happened in this picture, though, we're told the governor comes to faith. He's so compelled by the power that just happened and the words that he's heard that he is compelled to follow. 
So he begins to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He goes down the road of becoming a Christian and beginning that journey. And we see here the beginning of the Gentiles coming to faith. I don't know if you thought about this, but this story right now where we're at, you are a result of a journey that began out of Antioch. It was a pretty pivotal time. They had a purpose and a reason. <clears throat> but if we look back for a moment, how did it all get started? I think this is an important to know. We can fly through this and forget what was occurring when Paul and Barnabas set off. It says here that while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. So how's your worship? The Holy Spirit spoke to them while they were worshiping and fasting. Pastor Paul gave you a plate a few weeks ago. You might remember this if you were here. And, and he had you fill in some areas. But the whole point was, if God is not in the center of your worship, then the family, the work, the friends, and everything around it will not be impacted for what you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to be. If God is not the center of my worship, my family will not know that God is the center. So how's your worship? What does that look like? Are you intentionally focused and honoring God when you are engaging in your family? When you go to work, are you intentionally focused in honoring God with the level of work that you do, the commitment to the job that you have, even the ones perhaps that you go, I don't like the job I'm in today, but my master is who I serve, not my boss. Are you worshiping in that way? Are you worshiping in a way where you look and you say, the investment of my finances, the investment of my time, the investment of my service, the gifts that God has given me? Am I worshiping through those and expecting then God to show me what he has for me? Or are you hoping you can be over here doing what you want and expecting God to show you over here what he's calling you to do? See, I think they heard from God because God was the center. And they had a sincere desire to move forward, to do something more with their life. They knew what they were called to. It says here that uh, another piece, that while they're worshiping and fasting, remember the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Paul will call him for the work which I have called them. And so I want to encourage you for a moment that you have been called already. If, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been called to something greater. You've also been given the power of the Holy Spirit to do something greater. You've been equipped. You don't have to go find it. It came to you. What a gift. But I was thinking about <clears throat> how many times do we really know what our purpose is? What have I been called to? And I think this fits well in 2 Thessalonians. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Here it is. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. What is my purpose? So that the name of our Lord Jesus would be glorified in you. Is your life in such a way that it's so worshipful in your workplace or wherever you go? Are you loving your family and leading people well enough that the name of Jesus is being glorified in you? Because that is your purpose. That's what you've been called to. So I challenge you to think through that. And, and I was thinking, they took off and they began to go on this journey but what if they had done it differently? What, what if they did it this way? What if like my son, perhaps, I, I in the morning, I say, hey, hey, son, it's time to get up for school. So I go in there and I wake him up and he says, oh, okay, dad. And so I go out and expecting he's got the command. You're going to go to school. And I go in, I get my cup of coffee and perhaps begin to read my Bible in the morning. And a few minutes go by and I hear a voice, hey, dad, should I wear, uh, should I wear shorts or pants? I wear shorts, that'll be fine. Okay, Dad, and I continue on in my reading and finish my cup of coffee. And then a voice comes again, Dad, should I wear blue or white shirt? Which one? Put on the blue one. Okay? Okay, Dad, and now I have my breakfast, and I finish the breakfast, still no sun. I hear the voice again, Dad, should I come out to the kitchen? 
Yeah, that'd be a good idea because the command was go to school. Why don't you go ahead and get going on that idea? And I put my dishes away. He's still not there. He's standing in the hallway. Dad, what should I have for breakfast? Come into the kitchen first. And so he enters and, and we begin this dialogue. And I think, what if Paul and Barnabas had behaved that way? Hey, I know you said to go, but should we go by foot or boat? We'll just hang out and wait for God to confirm. Okay, we're on the boat. God, should we go to Cyprus or should we go to some other place? I think one of the things that I would like you to know is that, you see, a parked car is hard to steer. And if you're not making some decision to make some directional move, I think God is going, it's very difficult to steer you. You're going to find yourself doing all kinds of things and going all kinds of places. But where I want to take you takes some thought, right? So where are you going? So what does that mean to you? Where are you going? What does that mean? The first one I would ask is this. Uh, some of you perhaps today are going, you're wrestling with this idea. Should I give financially to support the church? Should I do that? I haven't started that process. It's part of I know God calls me to invest my treasure. And I would say, hmm, where are you going? How much should I give? Uh, hmm, I don't know. Where are you going? Next one, maybe he would ask, where, should I serve? I know there's, they need help, I heard, down here with the homeless people. They need help with the school. They need help over here with this group. I'm just going to wait on God to tell me which one to do. And I think, you know what? Some of you might be called to go to South County. That might be where God is calling you to go help Sky and launch a campus. Some of you might, in this room, be called to go overseas and do mission work full time. And some will be called here, just like we saw, to stay and support and pray and encourage and equip those in your area. But if you don't take a step and begin going, I think Pastor Will said it well last week, open the door, right? If you don't open the door, it's going to be hard to make any forward progress. And that, that South County move may not be the forever choice that God puts you in, but if you start moving, then he can steer you, right? Right? He wants to steer you. And I, I think it's important that we also realize that this process can be scary. It shouldn't be, but it can be. But I think we need to take that step. Let God begin to steer you. Don't be a parked car. Second thing I see here is that the two of them went on their way and they went. There was action. So we see that. There's action. And they also arrived. And they did this with intentionality. They knew their purpose. They knew where they were going. And they did this with intentionality. One, one of the things kind of to remind us of thinking of intentionality, there's this uh, thing we did several years ago in 2006. We felt very called as a church body to adopt a people group in Cambodia. And many of your signatures, perhaps even in green, might have been a part of that at some point. Were you committed to say, this is important, we're going to do this, we're going to do something intentionally. And God called and God steered us and there we land and, and uh, we're down the road a few years now. And God continues to work. And one of the things that we see happening now is we're challenged again to say, with intentionality, we believe we're called to the Brow People Group as well. They're right in that same area. And so as a church, we're going to begin to go in that direction. And we're going to invite you to be a part of that process to say, what would it look like? How can I be involved? How can I live intentionally? See, we, we can do lots of good things, but we need to do it with intentionality. And I think one of the things I'd ask is uh, on your seats, if you'd grab a card, I'd put those on your seat. I want to give you an opportunity to maybe give me some feedback. First of all, if you approach this card in a, in a form of guilt, that is not my intent. I am not to guilt you today if you mark no on everything. In fact, I didn't even ask for your names, okay? But I thought, how cool would it be if we could get a little sampling of, of how is Family Church impacting the globe? Not just Family Church organizationally, but independently, how are you as the body of Christ? What's your impact? What are you doing? And so I had a few questions for you. 
wonder if you'd answer, we're going to use this information not only to celebrate the impact that God is having through you, but also we have uh, somebody taking a class called Perspectives, and it's part of a uh, kind of a project. And they said, can we get some information? I said, yeah, let's find out. So here's a, a few questions. Do you personally support a, a missionary financially? Do you send five, 20, whatever, and say, I'm investing in somebody outside of my community, outside of my culture, so that the gospel can be advanced? And if so, if you don't mind, tell me who and, and what ministry they're with. How about do you regularly pray for a missionary? It costs you time. And if you've never done that and you want to get started, you can go in the lobby, find a, a prayer card for one of the missionaries that we collectively now support. You could do that. How about uh, have you ever served on a short-term mission trip? Not just with Family Church ever. Has that ever been something you've done where you've left your culture to go and share the gospel? Have you ever done that? And then finally, do you financially support any other mission organizations that are, that are purposed for sharing the gospel, like Samaritan's Purse or Compassion International? So if you could, and we could collect those, I'd love to just see what's, what's going on, because I hear little stories, and those are great things to share, too. You know, it's really cool. I get to talk to a friend, and they've got this Compassion International child they've been taking care of for a lot of years, and that, that individual's graduating. How cool to hear that story of a global impact far out of the reach of our, our hands, but certainly within the reach of God. So I'll collect those at the end. So when you're done, we'll remind me, please, I'll get those at the end. But um, I think it would be also really helpful if, if you felt in any way uneasy there, please just set that. It's okay. It wasn't meant to make you feel like, oh, I'm not doing it. This is a way you can live intentionally. Maybe today's the day you'll start one of those, Right? Let's move on uh, to something that's important. We talked about intentionality, and we see this later on, that when Paul and Barnabas set off, not only did they have strategy, they were intentionally going to the, the Jewish synagogues first, but a little further down in verse 46, we see this, that Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, speaking to those in the Jewish synagogue. He says, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of the eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. We begin to see a change that happens, but there's this intentional living, there's this intentional purpose and a direction that's going that's very strategic. They would go to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And so I want to challenge you to think for a moment in your intentional living, who are you living for? Oftentimes, it's really easy to live for me, not me personally, right? you personally, the me. I, I can remember uh, 28 years old, I'd been teaching now for about two years, and uh, I had my retirement in place. I was set. I was focused. I couldn't wait to make sure I had enough money to retire. And I'm realizing now from 28 to retirement, there's a few years in between that, right? <laughs> it, it takes a little longer than just a couple years so I'm in my mid-40s, and I'm looking back going, well, that was kind of foolish. There's a lot of life to hopefully be lived between here and there. What am I doing with it? Um, how about uh, your family? Is your family who you're living for? I'm not saying don't care for your family. First of all, if you hear that, you're wrong. <laughs> okay, love your family, care for them, God the center. But here's the deal. If the family cease to exist today, what are you living for? If they're the only thing you're holding on to, what are you living for? And, and uh, I would also consider maybe your job. Don't hear me today to say, don't work. <laughs> okay? That's not what I'm saying. God needs you to work. It's important. Support yourself. Support your family. But is the job what you're living for? If the job didn't exist tomorrow, what would you have? What would you have? Paul and I continued our journey and one of the things I can tell you about Pastor Paul, I'm talking about him now, clarify, is that he lives intentionally many times, and he would do some things to give me some intentional thoughts. So I can remember specifically, we were in the boat, I think I'd been coming to church a couple years, and uh, we're hanging out, we're sitting down on anchor in the bay catching crab. And he looks to me and he says, hey, you've been coming to church for a while. I don't know if you said it that way, but basically. And he says, hey, have you ever uh, considered sharing your testimony on stage? 
<laughs> oh, you're a nut, dude. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. In my head, I said that. I just sort of went, mm-hmm, yeah. No, I haven't thought about that. Can we talk about anything else but that, right? Can we change the discussion? Little did he know that eventually I would share my testimony in a church. Hmm. And then there was a time also when, uh, before I was on staff and I was like, hey, Paul, I had this weird dream that I was like had sharing a message or something like kind of like preaching or something. I don't know. And he goes, well, maybe you're supposed to preach someday. And I thought, you are something else. No, no, I don't think so. I just maybe I thought I had an idea for you. I think that's what that was about is I was going to tell you how to do it. And, and, uh, and here I am today. We started throwing snowballs and we end up in discussions. And what I realized about Paul is he lived intentionally with me, is he learned how to ask questions. And those questions, they led to conversations. And those conversations led to spiritual discoveries. God was at work in the conversation, but Paul was at work being intentional. Pastor Paul, clarity. The last part I want to focus on today is I want you to consider the value of the team, the necessity of a team. You see, you have to remember there's always going to be opposition. Elmaus was opposition. And sometimes we come to a church like this gathering, and we're having a tough time, and, and we're, we're feeling like nobody reached out to me, as if somehow, magically, I'm to know your mind. And all of us are supposed to know what's going on in your life. But see, your team is there for you. You've got to have a team. And we see the team in our story today in verse 5. It said, the two of them, and then it also said later on that John was with them as their helper. So who's your team? Who are you taking with you? Who's your team? Paul and I continued to meet together, and Paul influenced me, Pastor Paul influenced me a great deal. Uh, we talk a lot, we've talked a lot over the years, and one of the things that I, I realized, and even in raising my own kids, is there's this idea here that quantity of time leads to quality. So who's on your team, and, and are you spending time together? Because it's not going to happen on a Sunday morning greet, on a Monday morning cup of coffee, and then on Tuesday you confront somebody and say, are you ready to follow Jesus today? Ooh, that was a little fast. It's a good question, but maybe your timing was off a little bit. Are you spending enough time with the people on your team to make an impact? Remember, quality comes out of quantity. It's really hard to have that trusting, deep relationship with somebody and ask those questions without spending time together. Would you agree with that? This is an important part. And so I want you to think about something. Who are you taking with you to build that time? Paul and I would spend time together in the boat. I try to take people uh, when I can. That's one of the ways that I like to spend time with people is not only doing something I enjoy, but doing something they enjoy. Some of you uh, like to go watch ball games, whether it's basketball or football. Have you ever considered letting that be a part of building a relationship with somebody? Or are you just focused on getting to the game? Who could you take with you? Have you ever thought about going shopping and inviting a friend that perhaps you've been sharing the gospel with, sharing your life with, and saying, hey, what do you think? You want to go get groceries? I know it seems a little weird, but you want to go hang out? Yeah, sure. We'll get a cup of coffee after, whatever. Who are you taking with you? Because this isn't going to happen without some intentionality. One of the things I think uh, I want you to kind of end with is this thought. If your life is centered around God, and you're living for worship of him, intentionally, aware of your purpose, and you're building a team around you, I believe you will begin to live an exponential life. I believe that God will work through you and the Holy Spirit will be alive and you will get to see the fruit of that through the years to come. But it's going to take some work. It's going to take some intentionality. I'm going to release to green right now. You guys have a great time down there with Pastor Will. Talk to you soon. I'm going to close here with a couple thoughts and then I'll pray for you. First one would be this, pretty straightforward. 
Who's discipling you? Who's your Barnabas? Who's in your life today that's investing in you? Now, if you think you've reached the point where you don't need a disciple, I would love to talk to you afterward, okay? (laughs) There is always some encouragement necessary, regardless of the path you've been walking or the length of time that you've been going. I mean, when I meet with Pastor Paul, sometimes it blows my mind. He's been here a few years, and I've been here 20 And he lets me pour into him and he pours into me. Like, how cool is that? The second question is, who are you discipling? Who are you intentionally spending time with to share the gospel and to encourage and equip? Who is that for you? If you don't have anybody, I would encourage you to think about when you come and gather on the weekends, perhaps the first person's hand you shake, you might say, hey, my name is Craig. What is your name? Right? (laughs) And you can begin a journey of discussion. Hey, do you meet with anybody right now? I'm looking for somebody that we could, you know, go through the Bible with together. It's a scary question because they might say yes. I'm looking for somebody. If you don't have somebody, I would encourage you also in your life groups. If you're involved in a life group, ask somebody there to meet more regularly, not just in your life group time. Just challenge you to that. Think about Who's discipling you and who are you discipling? Let me pray for you as we kind of close. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. What a, what a joy to see you working through Barnabas. We get to see the transformation and the transition of Saul to Paul. I thank you that uh, Pastor Paul was in my life, that he was part of the reason I'm here today. And there are many others involved in that, and I, I lift that up to you and say thank you. And I pray for each person here that they would really evaluate Are you the center of their worship? God, I pray for your spirit to empower those who are unsure of what you're calling them to. And we thank you so much for the love that you pour over us. May our lives reflect you and may may our light shine the name of Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Amen. I have kind of an important announcement, so we're going to pause for a minute before I collect those cards for those of you who are so awesome and on the spot. I want to take a minute and kind of have a family discussion. I want to give you some updates uh, about our REACH campaign. So if you're, if you're visiting, you're wondering, what is that all about? We're, we have a plan right now that we're, uh, we feel God's calling us not only to launch a second campus in South, South County, but also there's some repairs and improvements and things needed here. So we're, uh, we're striving to reach uh, not only Douglas County and beyond, but we've got some work to do here in Sutherland. So I want to give you a couple announcements, and I'm going to read them so I don't misquote them, so you can't say I did. Clear? Okay, Frank, are you listening? (laughs) All right, I got to give Frank a hard time this morning. We had fun this morning. So um, first of all, I want you to know that there are times when a campus needs focus. Do you realize that there's going to be a day potentially where the green campus may have to have a different building? That could very likely happen, okay? And we will be called as a group to help that happen because we're family church. And do you realize that as we launch a campus down south that there could be a day there where they have to have a building and we will be called as family church to do that. And we're calling on Green to help support not just South County's effort, but to help this campus. And I wanna start by saying this. When I came to family church 20 years ago, there was a wall back there. There was no seating. And I can remember sitting listening as they were building these areas, and they bought these new chairs, and I was brand new to church, and I thought, wow, this is a really nice place to be. And I heard about they were raising money, and I thought, I don't give money to the church, and I'm not going to be a part of that. But I want to thank each of you that was here personally, because I am a part, a product of your investment. So thank you. And those of you who are wondering, why would we Why would we fix up the building or add those things? It's because I hope that you realize that 20 years from now, that's the impact we're hoping for. And you know, it's not very glorious when you have a car to put new tires on a car. Would you agree? It's kind of lame, actually. I hate buying tires. I don't want to buy asphalt. (laughs) I don't want us to have to pay for asphalt. And they say, if you do any improvement, guess what? There are things you have to do. So yeah, it costs some money. And so that's what we're here to talk about. What does it take to make this campus uh, be completed? First of all, I want you to celebrate. So you have to clap. Can you clap for me? Oh, not yet. (laughs) 
You're good though. Okay, you're warmed up. Excellent. Okay, first one is we've had over a million dollars pledged at this point. Now you clap. Okay, and just last month alone, there was 30,000 more that came in in pledges. Clap for that, because that's huge, right? We got to celebrate that, because when you look on the scale, it doesn't look like there's much growth, but I'm telling you, that's huge. That is huge. Um, we want you to know that we have uh, all kinds of things happening. We've hired, as you know, Sky for the South County. We've also looked at, uh, we've hired uh, a children's and youth kind of worker at this point, a director, uh, when that person will start is still dependent on some things. But there's movement made to launch that campus. Uh, we've also, we've met with the professionals who design all the stuff in this building that's going to be needed for changes. So that's some of the progress that's happening. Also, what's ahead? We're hoping to break ground here uh, sometime in the next year. Also, uh, we're working on negotiations in South Umpqua. At this point, it looks like we're going to a school. We're going to keep praying about that. If you remember the, the green campus launch, uh, some things changed direction. Remember, there's this let's get started and let God steer us thing. But that's where we believe we're going to start is in a, in a school gymnasium. So we're, we're encouraged by that. I want you to know that we're also, uh, not only are we halfway point in reaching our financial goal, but there is some needed. So here's what it looks like. Imagine if uh, for the next three years, by the way, it's a three-year campaign. So if you're kind of going, why aren't we there yet? It's a three-year campaign, Okay. Can I, can I say that sharply enough? Like it takes time, but it takes investment. So if we were to actually look at what it takes to get everybody there to raise the money necessary, uh, we would need an additional 275 more people um, doing 100 bucks a month. So, I mean, think about it from those standpoints. I'm trying to make it tangible. Because for me, 2 million is like, I'm not going to come up with that for you. But well, I could do an extra 10 a month. I could do an extra 30 a month. So inside you, your uh, program, you have this commitment card. So this is the REACH commitment card. If you uh, haven't considered that, please consider it. If you feel pressured right now, don't feel pressured. If you're visiting, I'm not asking for anything from you. Just listen. But if you're a part of Family Church and you say, you know what? I guess I do have a role to play that I do care about 20 years from now who's sitting in these seats. I think this is important. Okay, so I hope you don't feel pressured by that, but sometimes we don't, we don't talk about money very often at Family Church. In fact, we don't pass a plate. We don't want to pressure you, but the fact is it, it is necessary at times. So I have a cool video I want you to celebrate. Check this out. It's a miracle what God has done here for the last over 40 years. And every church that grows is a miracle, and Family Church is one of those. And as God has used us to reach out to people here in Sutherland, then on to Green, and now on to South Umpqua, we've come to those places where we have to say, oh man, this isn't working. And so God challenges us, and we, we add a new service sometimes, and sometimes we add new buildings, and sometimes we just add a new program. But God has been using this process for by faith, we have to step forward because we believe that God wants to reach more people. And it's always scary, but God always comes through. And then at the end, you have this amazing story. We just, we just had a baptism and had some amazing stories of lives being changed. And as you watch those stories, you think, this is what it's about. And we trust God is going to use us where we are right now to reach even more. One thing that we know is important at Family Church is connecting. And right now at the Sutherland campus, we have to reevaluate our ministry space. Behind me is the south entrance to the building, and because of the logistics of our property and our parking, half of the people who attend church on the weekends come through these doors. This doesn't allow them the opportunity to come into a lobby where people are there to connect with them, where they can get information about what's going on at Family Church. And one of the exciting things that we're gonna have in the remodel is a new lobby back here. So when someone walks in the door, whether it's the front door or the south entrance, they're gonna come into a place where they can connect with people and gather and be together. We're in the upper auditorium right now, and I'm excited. This is going to be some beautiful, big ministry space. It's going to open the door for all kinds of student ministry and potential other multi-uses. It's also going to have a new live stream room. Where we'll be able to do all of the things that we do for online community, which 50 or 60 people watch a weekend. There'll also be a studio where we can take and do videos without a huge setup. And I'm really excited. This is going to make it accessible for all of us because right behind me is where the elevator is going to be. And we've been waiting for that for a long time. And so this is going to be a new, renovated, beautiful ministry space. Also at Sutherland Campus, we're excited about a brand new kids wing. Currently how the system is set up is first through sixth grade 
actually either meets in the fellowship hall or in the modular. But with the new design, all kids ministry will be in the same location for a safe, fun, and secure space. There will also be a central check-in system to check in your kids as you enter into service. The last couple months, we've been meeting with a building group to finalize some of our plans. We just want to say thank you to all who have continued to give towards this campaign. We're excited to see what God is going to do in the next year as we are planning to break ground. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.